Okay, so um, yeah, so so this is really cool. This, if you've never seen it before, are Gauss's tables. So Gauss is trying to, uh, this is computing the number of primes up to 500 or a million or 15, uh, 500,000, then a million, then one and a half million, then two million, then two and a half million, and so on. This is the uh, benchmark. And this is how many primes there are up to that range. And here he's computing the integral dt over log t, dn over log n. Wait, is it in his handwriting? That is Gauss's handwriting. This is Gauss's wow, actual handwriting. <laughs> I put a link to this on our on our website right here, Gauss's hand mm. computation. And uh, this is him realizing that lie of x should be a good approximation up to square root. So you see, see here, the first three digits are correct out of a six digit number, and the last digits aren't. Um, I wonder how good his computation is. I think it's pretty good. Let's see. Um, <laughs> let's just test him for a second. Yeah, yeah. So log integral. I think that's the function of 3 million. Oh, of course. Give me the numerical value. Um, can I make this bigger so you guys can see? How about that? OK, so log integral, we're saying, or Mathematica is saying, that it is uh, 216.971. And Gauss is saying 216.970. So this is you know, 1801 or something. Uh, I don't know when these tables are from, by the way. This is a letter that he writes at some point. But these, these, are, these are tables that he computed. Uh, there's a nice discussion by, by Yuri Chinko. OK, this is a letter. To Dirichlet. Okay, there's a letter to Dirichlet from the 1920s. I wish from my heart a situation in which you can, as much as possible, remain the master of your time and choice in your tasks. I see. Um, anyway, so this is Gauss's hand computation of lie. And then how many primes? Let's see how close he got. Uh, it's not so hard, uh, prime pi function. Prime pi function of 3 million is. 216, 816, and he got 216, 745. He missed a couple, you know, 50 primes <laughs> out of 200,000 by hand he missed. But what he got right, seemingly, is the fact that the first half of the digits are accurate. So if you believe the, the if you believe what is now Riemann's hypothesis, that the logarithmic integral function approximates the prime counting function to square root error, well, what does square root mean? The square root, the size of a number is half square root digits, half right. the digits. So the bottom half of the digits will be garbled, but the front half should be correct. So here it is, Gauss is computing the front, uh, the front half of the digits for the, the, the logarithmic integral function and the number of primes of x. Wait, how, how have they guessed lie of x? Um, that is a great question. How do they actually compute this in this time um i don't know i don't know maybe he used something like the trapezoid rule maybe he used um you know lie one over one over log of n when you replace n by n plus one it changes by very little could have they fact, done like a, a series expansion or something like some sort I would, of that's uh... what i would imagine yeah not a series expansion of lie there is a series expansion of lie um but I think he would take log and approximate, you know, if you know what log is for a large number, you replace that large number by one, it only changes by very little, right? The derivative of log is one over x. And then how, how, had they, how did they have the heuristic that you should compare the prime counting function against lie of x? So this is the, the magic of Gauss. Gauss was saying uh, the number of primes He's saying the density of primes of size around x, he thinks is like one over log x. And that uh, he got experimentally. That's... He was comparing tables of, he was computing tables of logarithms, you know, up the wazoo. He made these, these massive, uh, he says somewhere, I can't believe, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I don't know if he says it here, I'm embarrassed <laughs> to tell you how many hours I spent, uh, you know, idly computing when I had nothing better to do. When I was fresh out of ideas, I would just sit there and, and compute, you know, a, a thousand, uh, uh, values uh, of this thing. And then this is just the summer. So um, yeah, months and months and months, years of idle computation.
and you notice this pattern. Get the number of primes up to three million. Uh, by sieving, by sieving. Okay. Exactly the Eratosthenes method. You, you cut out, you know, there, there's slightly better ways of, of doing this, but if you want the number of primes in a big chunk of, uh, you know, if you want the number of primes, okay, so I guess we should have done this on, on day negative one or something, but uh, Eratosthenes, you, presumably you guys all, all know this. I mean, we talked about Eratosthenes uh, on, uh, on day one, but not what the process is, right? So, so you would write down like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and then 10, 20, 30, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Okay, so, so this number represents 100. And, um, and then you, well, one is a unit, and then two is your first prime, and then you throw away all the multiples of two. And then three is your next prime, and then you, and then you throw away all the multiples of three and so on, which will go like this. And then and four was already gone. Five is your next prime. You throw away all the multiples of five. These were already gone. Uh, six was already gone. Uh, seven is your next prime. You throw away all the multiples of seven, and you're done. Every single number that's left is prime. Eratosthenes' great observation is that in order to sieve out all of the numbers, uh, all of the non-primes less than 100, you have to remove primes less than 10. And there's only four yes. primes less than 10. Right, and the reason root. 10... What's that? No, yeah, the square root. That you have a have a prime so dividing the below root. the square root. Yep. If a number is composite, if a times b is equal to n and n is less than x, then either a is less than root x or b is less than root x. Okay. So this is a very efficient method. It'll give you lots and lots of primes, and you can do this once you have tables of primes. You just extrapolate this out for for far distances. Gauss is doing something slightly more sophisticated, but but this is the basic uh, idea for. For how to get prime. You're not you're not taking every number and trying to compute whether or not it's prime one by one. You do you do them in in big chunks like this. So then it's like if you have square root of three million, right? It's gonna end up being something like you know. Yeah, it's not that bad. Square root of square root of a million is a thousand. Right, right. If so you throw away all the like primes less than a thousand, that'll get you you know chunks of. Uh, primes up to a million if you, if you do it piece by piece so he does it like you know in, in groups of size a thousand looks for multiples of, of primes that he knows in his list anyway so um right so this is uh this is gauss's old hand on hand so let's just record what we what we uh, are observing so gauss you know he says when he was a boy like age 15 16 or something this is probably uh 1790s uh computes tables of, uh, it's traditionally called pi of x. I guess I can't break this tradition now, but uh, people find it, people think pi is 3.14. Pi of x is the, is the number, is the number of primes up to x. And he also computes tables of lie of x, which some people start at zero, but then you have to deal with what happens at one where uh, log blows up. The way that it blo blows up is, is fine. And this is a, uh, I like this function like. Anyway, so he sees, he conjectures that uh, pi of x is asymptotic to lie of x. And of course, Riemann's hypothesis, which we're about to get to, is that pi of x is in fact equal to lie of x up to an error. Can I slide this out of the way? Not easily. Okay, zoom in. Uh, up to an error of um, one half plus epsilon for any epsilon. Okay. So um, so what Riemann, the whole point of Riemann's memoir, and by the way, uh, Legendre, he mentions uh, Legendre here. Uh, as Legendre discussed, he was looking for some, some formula, some asymptotic formula. So precursor to this is Legendre thinking that pi of x might be asymptotic to not just x over log x, but x over log x plus some constant. And he's saying that constant is zero. Not only is this constant zero, but, uh, but actually the, the, so x over log x is a bad approximation. So when people say, oh yeah, this is approximation, this is approximate to x over log x. Well, lie of x is x over log x plus something that fluctuates like x over log squared. 
let's point this out. This is equal to x over log x plus big omega of x over log squared x. That's the next order term. Right. You can like integrate by parts or something. Exactly. Um, right. Exactly. So the difference between these two things is something of size x over log squared. And so that's not going to give you a single leading digit. I mean, it'll give you the leading order, but not, but not even one digit out of, uh, out of however many, whereas this is giving you half of the digits. So this is half of the digits are accurate, half of the digits. That lie lets you compute instantly um, are accurate. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, so anyway, that was just a little aside for why, why Riemann was, was doing what he was doing. So last time, let's recall, we, we proved two things. We studied the Mellon transform and inversion formula. Mellon transform inversion, uh, which says if you have a nice function f um, from the positive reals to r or c, whatever, uh, then the transform, the Mellon transform is an integral like this. And the inversion is that if you take the Mellon transform, you multiply it by the opposite character, integrates over a vertical line, like real part of S equals two, one over two pi i, you will recover the value of f of one. Okay, so that's what we did last time. Uh, two things, one is this, Sorry, there's something in the chat. It's just a letter. When you were talking about pi. Ah, yeah. But it has become traditional. See, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm getting uh, sucked into talking to the public. And if you, if you use the traditional terminology, pi of x, when you're speaking to the public, Nothing that you say after that will make any sense to them because they'll, they'll just be hung up on, but that's, I don't understand, 3.14 times X, what is that, what's going on? So anyway, whatever. It, you, you guys aren't the public, so you can get away with it. All right, uh, we talked about Mel in, in transform and inversion, and we talked about Poisson summation. Sum F of N, N in Z is the sum uh, F hat, of m, m in z, and in fact, the dilated version, which is even better for our purposes, t, one over t, over t, right? We discussed all of this. And so Riemann's memoir takes these two things, except he's doing it explicitly and we'll do it not explicitly, we'll do it sort of uh, the right way uh, by Tate's uh, process, Tate's observation. So the Riemann, Memoir uh, after Tate um, is is the following. Okay, so now we're now we're ready for Riemann's understanding of the the zeta function. It's the following. You take this thing. So let's say f is even. Say f is even. Okay, uh, this is a simple exercise. This is true if and only if the Fourier transform is even. So both of them get to be even at the same time, right? F of x, f of negative x is equal to f of x. In that case, this is equal to, well, there's the value when n equals zero, f of zero, and then I can group the negative and positive values. So that's twice the sum over the positive integers, f of nt. And this object is what I will call the theta function. So um, yeah, let's put it here, theta f of t by definition. So theta function given some test function f is a sum over the positive integers f of nt. And Riemann's big idea is to take, so big idea, very simple idea, uh, look at the Mellon transform, compute, the Mellon transform of the theta function, as always, in several ways. Uh, all of number theory is you have some interesting object that you cook up, and then you compute its value in two different ways, and then something interesting happens. 
Okay, so the Mellon transform again is an integral from zero to infinity of this theta function of t, t to the s dt over t, just like the Mellon transform of anything. Now, do we have a right to, um, does this have a chance of converging somewhere? So let's talk about convergence for just a second. I know this is just a crash course and I'm sort of uh, avoiding convergence like the plague, but actually here there's, there's some interesting points to be made. So for example, um, so can this converge? Does this have a chance of converging? Can this converge? Is there some nice class in which this converges? Um, so let's take uh, as, our, as our basic example, which is literally the, uh, the function that Riemann does all of this with, almost, there's, there's some variation. I'll, I'll show you what Riemann's memoir looks like also. Um, e to the minus pi t squared, the Gaussian, of course. Okay, so if we have the Gaussian, then what can we say about this? So um, then what can we say about the sum e to the minus pi n squared t squared? over the positive integers. So this is an exponentially converging uh, series. So it's bounded by the first term. And so uh, it's bounded, let's say up to the constant, up to a constant by, in fact, that constant might even be one. I'll let you uh, work that out as an exercise by e to the minus pi t. Okay, so at infinity, at infinity, this is, this is a polynomial times an exponential. There's no problem with convergence. No problem with convergence. Okay, what's happening near zero? What about at zero? What about as t goes to zero? Okay, so let's go back to our theta function and plus on summation. All right, I'm not gonna be able to fit this on one, on one page. Um, I'll just write it here. F of nt is equal to one over t, f hat of mt. Okay, so let's go back to our theta function, which is a sum over the positive values, f of nt. This is equal to, remember, um, this we, we wrote was equal to f of zero plus twice the theta function. So I want to move everything to the, other side, to the other side. By the way, this is also one over t f hat of zero. Again, f hat is also even. This is m over t uh, plus twice. What will this be? It'll be the theta function of f hat, not at t, but at one over t. Does everybody see that? And so let's move things to the other side. This is equal to the theta function of f hat at one over t. And then I have a plus, there's a factor of two that I divided through, let's keep these things separate, plus um, one over two t f hat of zero minus this f of zero, one half f of zero, okay? So as so now let's look at this formula. As t goes to as t as t goes to zero, what do we see here? One over t goes to infinity. This has exponential decay. This has exponential decay. This is a constant. This grows. This blows up at a polynomial rate, like, like one over t. In fact, it's literally one over t. So of course it blows up like one over t. Okay, um, let's put that, let's look at what happens to that inside the Mellon transform. So um, integral near zero from whatever to zero of this thing, t to the s dt over t will, will blow up like, or we'll, we'll uh, since this thing is like one over t, so I'm integrating near zero, one over t, t to the s dt over t. So this is t to the s minus two. This does converge, converges if, um, converges absolutely if and only if, but it converges if the real part of s minus two is at least negative one. In other words, if the real part of s is bigger than one. 
Okay, if I did that too fast, just think about it on your own. So we do have absolute convergence. So uh, theta, so the Mellon transform, at least in some nice class, we did it for this one example, but if, uh, we did, uh, but anything that has exponential decay will have the same, any test function F with exponential decay at infinity will have the same uh, issues with growth, growth rate and so on. So this thing, uh, so for, real part of s greater than one, we have absolute convergence. This is an absolutely convergent, convergent integral, okay? Integral from zero to infinity, uh, theta, which is this, in, this sum over the positive values f of nt, t to the s dt over t. Any questions so far? No problem with this integer. Okay. Well, it's absolutely convergent. What can we do with absolutely convergent integrals? We got two sums. Yep, exactly. We've got two sums, so we've got them the wrong way around. And at least one integral from zero to infinity, f of nt, t to the s, dt over t. And then Riemann notices, okay, let's make a change of variables. T goes to T over N. Well, then that N is gone. This T becomes a T over N. The range of integration since N is positive is still from zero to infinity. DT over T remains invariant because multiplying by a real number, a positive real number is invariant under harm measure. And so all that happens is this N to the S comes out here. And now there's no n. This has nothing to do with n. Out pops zeta, perfectly well defined in this range. And this is just f of t, t to the s dt over t. That's exactly the definition of the Mellon transform of f. We did nothing. We did Poisson summation. It's just summing over the integers forces the zeta function to come out. Okay. That's, that's this amazing insight that was hidden. So Riemann did this again with special functions using the exponential function and, and out came the gamma function. Of course, uh, okay, so let's see why we get the gamma function. Uh, in our example, in uh, our example with f of t being the Gaussian, did we compute the Mellon transform of the Gaussian yet? We computed the exponential Mellon transform and got gamma, but how about the Gaussian? It's the same computation, uh, e to the minus pi t squared t to the s dt over t. Let's make a change of variables. u is equal to pi t squared. So du is equal to pi times two t dt. And if I divide by u, and I divide by u on this side, I get that dt over t uh, times two, I guess, is du over u. Square root, so uh, t is equal to um, u over pi to the one half. And the square root function on the positive real numbers behaves very nicely. So this is gonna be an integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus u. t to the s is u to the one half, Zoom puts all of these ex extra things that I don't want. U over pi to the one half to the S power. So this is to the S over two. DT over T is DU over U with a factor of one half. Let me write this bigger over here so we can all see. So this is one half. There's a pi to the um, S over two, but it's in the denominator. And then what's left is that e to the u, u to the s over two, du over u, that's just gamma of s over two. So that is what he got, that's what Riemann got over here. Today we call this the, uh, the factor at infinity of x. When we interpret, so Tate's uh, big insight is that you should reinterpret the fact that what you get on this side is a, is a product, this zeta, if you remember, is we have an Euler product. Uh, he called these the finite factors. So this is adelically what comes out, one over one minus one over p to the s. Uh, 
Ah. Zoom windows. Okay. So um, in this sense, it's a product over all primes, now including the prime at infinity, the place at infinity. And this is the value of the place at infinity. This gamma function is the natural analog, actually. If you, if you do this computation phiatically, which uh, let's not, um, you get exactly this. This thing is the gamma function, the phiatic gamma function. All right. Um, never mind if you don't uh, understand what that means. When you see it later, you'll, you'll say, oh, I, I knew that already. OK, so what have we concluded? We observed, so, so far, so far, so good. Any questions? Yeah, this is like out of left field in a way. But um, so the, I know that Gaussian is, is like very special and important for many reasons, including, for example, it's a Fourier uh, dual or self, self. And so when I've learned about this piatic thing, it's like you start with like an indicator function of the piatic integers and take like some sort of Fourier transform of it. And then you end up with this Euler factor. Uh -huh. But I, I was wondering, is, is this is one thing that that also kind of characterizes the Gaussian is that it's like a stable distribution. Like it, it, it so it's going to show up in central limit theorems because it sort of has to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is there like some sort of cent are there central piatic central limit theorems that like say that these distributions have to show up in limits? Yeah, that is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, let's look that up and try to find out. All right, That's I'll a look at the question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, let's find out. It's a great question. Um, so, so far, what we've shown is that this. Would you, would you mind saying the question again? Yeah, the question is, you know, the, the Gaussian is, is a very special thing. Uh, it comes up, even if you don't want to study the Gaussian, you're forced to study the Gaussian, for example, because of the central limit theorem. If you're looking at uh, any, you, you know, your favorite nice enough probability distribution and you, and you take uh, lots of coin flips, they'll converge to the Gaussian distribution. So is there right. a piatic analog of that that forces the piatic uh, in the same way that this is the piatic gamma function. So this, uh, sorry, this is the real gamma function. This is the piatic gamma function. Um, is there a probability density? Uh, if you took a probability piatic probability density that took values, I guess, in the piatics, I have to think about uh, how to make sense of this, but uh, that under convolution, iterated convolution and, and proper rescaling, it converges to this piatic Gaussian function. I think there is something like that. I just don't know off the top of my head what it is. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. So, so far, if the real part of S is bigger than one, we computed this Mellon transform and we found that the Mellon transform was equal to uh, zeta using the definition of zeta in the range of absolute convergence times the Mellon transform of this favorite test function. Yes. Okay. Then Riemann did a second thing. We're going to, okay, that's one evaluation. Again, you get nothing from one evaluation. No credit. There's no 50% credit for one evaluation. You need two evaluations to get, to get anything. And here's what he does. He says, OK, I'm going to take this Mellon transform, and I'm just going to break it up into an integral from 1 to infinity plus an integral from 0 to 1. The integral from 1 to infinity, let's, let's separate these pieces. The integral from 1 to infinity, let's observe. The integral from 1 to infinity of the theta function, right? a sum f of n t, t n bigger than 1, t to the s, dt over t. This is entire. It starts at 1, not at 0. So there's no question about convergence at 1. And at infinity, this is exponentially decaying. It beats any polynomial growth. This is actually an entire function, entire function of s. So what about this integral from 0 to 1? So on the integral from 0 to 1, instead of taking the theta function, this version of the theta function, he goes back and takes the functional equation, right? This version of the theta function, the functional equation for the theta function. So let's move this into, um, into this region. So what was it? It was something like theta of f hat 
of not t but one over t um, with it with a factor of one over t. Did I lose my factor of one over t? I did. There's a there's a one over t in front of this theta, so I lost the one over t. That's going to be important in a second. Okay, so there's a one over t, and then minus was a two. It was a plus two over t f hat of zero and a minus, uh, not two over t, one over two t. One over two t. It doesn't really matter, but let's at least some things let's get right. Uh, and this all to the power t to the s dt over t. Okay, did I get that right? I think that's right. Can someone vouch for me? I think it's okay. All right. This part of the integral, you can evaluate completely explicitly. It's just a polynomial integrated from zero to, to one. Okay, so what do we have here? I have a f hat of zero over two, and then a t to the s minus two. t to the s minus two is t to the s, the integral of t to the s minus two is t to the s minus one over s minus one integrated from zero to one. At one, its value is one. At zero, its value is zero. Minus f of zero over two times now just t to the s over t. And the integral of t to the s minus one is t to the s over s. It's integrated from zero to one. So there's just this. That's it. OK, so that's this bit of it. And how about this bit? On this bit, so let's write this bit out. This bit is the integral from 0 to 1. Um, theta f hat of 1 over t, t to the s minus 1 dt over t. That's why I knew there had to be a 1 over t here. And now we're going to make a change of variables. t goes to 1 over t. T goes to T inverse. Par measure is invariant. Well, it's invariant, it gets a minus sign. That minus sign will allow us to flip orders. So instead of going from infinity to one, we integrate from one to infinity. Theta F hat, not one over T, but T. T to the, not S minus one, but one minus S, DT over T. And now let's look at what we've done. Let's put all of this together. So we have the Mellon transform, which on one hand is zeta of s, zeta of s times the Mellon transform of f is equal to this integral is equal to. Let's let's take these pieces out first. So there's some some finite little pieces here. Two times. Um, I'm going to write this in a funny way. Negative f hat of 0 times 1 minus s minus f of 0 over 2 times s plus an integral from 1 to infinity. This bit is theta of t, theta of t times t to the s. This bit is right here, theta hat, theta of f hat of t times t to the 1 minus s, dt over t. This thing is completely entire. It only goes from 1 to infinity. It has exponential decay no matter what value of s is. Converges absolutely. At one, there's no problem with convergence. This bit, well, it's also, uh, it's meromorphic. So this has poles at s equals 0 and s equals 1, but otherwise perfectly uh, analytic. Why do we end up with minus f hat of 0 over 2, 1 minus s? So oh, I took from the s, s minus 1 to 1 minus, minus s. I see minus it now. S. Yeah. yeah. So the functional equation is easier, right? And the functional equation, so if, uh, okay, so first thing is analytic continuation. Let's just, let's just finish saying that. So this 
is the, the analytic continuation. Of course, uh, if f uh, tilde is entire. So the reason it's called the Riemann zeta function, people, uh, this, this bothers me. Um, so uh, note, summation one over n to the s is not the Riemann zeta function. I know people like to uh, call it the Riemann. That's not the Riemann zeta function. The Riemann zeta function is this one over f tilde of s times negative f hat of zero over two, one minus s minus f of zero over two times s plus the integral from one to infinity theta. Okay, I'll write the whole so you thing. You can explicitly evaluate it, right? You don't have to depend on a wonky analytic continuation. Um, uh, well, you mean that this one can be explicitly, can be easily evaluated. Yeah. Right, right. Using, you, using what's in the bottom. Yeah. Right, right. Using what's in the bottom. And this only converges if a uh, real part of S is bigger than one and so on. This thing, this god awful thing, this is the Riemann zeta function. Now here's something really crazy. This is totally crazy. This blows my mind every time I see it. I've known it for 20 years. Where's F on this side? Any function, how could this possibly take the same value regardless of the function, the test function? Where is the invariance of the test function? Does not depend, does not depend on choice of your test function. I still don't understand. I don't have a, I don't have a logical explanation for this. You take your function, f. You sum it over the positive integers. You, you also do the same thing for the Fourier transform. You add these things up. I guess it's sort of hidden here. It's sort of hidden here because of why should the sum of the function's values at the integers be equal to the function's values at its Fourier transform. It's, it, it doesn't depend on the choice of f in the same way. Okay, so neither does, neither does the sum of f of n minus the sum of f hat of n. This also doesn't depend on the choice of f. Okay, that's what's hidden in here. What's hidden in here is Poisson summation. Poisson summation is the reason the Riemann zeta function exists, and it's also the reason the Riemann zeta function has analytic continuation. Okay, so um, if you took some nice function here, some nice test function that you know had compact support or something, this thing would be entire. That's not a Fourier transform, that's a Mellon transform. This thing would be entire. So let's look at this for a second. Um, uh, yeah, but we don't know where it, where it might, vanish no um okay let, let's go to let's go to what what Riemann actually did so let's specialize to um yeah we haven't gotten the functional equation so this is just the analytic continuation okay this, this so, so the whole thing is now meromorphically continued so we have meromorphically continued this gives the meromorphic continuation and of course if f is equal to f hat for whichever choice of test function it doesn't have to be the Gaussian of course, the Gaussian does satisfy that condition, then it's obvious just by looking at it that when you replace s by one minus s, you have a complete symmetry. You have a complete symmetry in, um, so then this theta f tilde of s is equal to theta f tilde of one minus s. Traditionally, this thing is called the C function, the, the completed, in the case of the Gaussian, this is called the completed zeta function. Anyway. So then it's just blatantly obvious that its value at s is equal to its value at one minus s. And that's why I put the minus sign here. This is sometimes possible to not do, like not prove certain kinds of theorems because you don't have the exact symmetry and you have only a this partial symmetry. So say more. Um, what do you mean by that? 
Right. So it's like if you choose a task function that is not its own uh, Fourier huh. transform, is it like then not possible to achieve certain results, even though there seems to be at least some partial symmetry on the right hand side? Yeah. So um, in general, when you're uh, when you're evaluating L functions, there is sometimes um, there is sometimes gain things to be gained from having imbalanced test functions. To, to put into uh, you know summation formulas where there's an imbalance that let you dualize in one direction but not another, um, yeah. So you don't have to take uh, here for uh, for your test function to be something balanced like the Gaussian. Well, that's more in the Mellon version, which we're about to do in, in a second. Anyway, so um, yeah. So what have we done? We've done the meromorphic continuation, and now we have the functional equation. Great. Let's let's specialize. Let's see what we can learn. So, this is all. Uh, so, specialize to f of t is the Gaussian, whose Mellon transform we just computed. What is a half or something? There's a pi to the minus s gamma of s over two. There's either a two here or a half. I think it's a half. So, if we specialize to this function, let's see what we've learned. We've learned that zeta of s times these things times uh, a half pi to the minus s gamma of s over two is equal to the value of this at zero is one, right? We need the value at zero. Where is it? Uh, the value at zero of it and the Fourier transform. So I get negative one over two s, negative one over two s, negative one over two one minus s, and then this integral, which now has the same theta function on both sides. So it's actually theta f, theta of this Gaussian of t times t to the s plus t to the one minus s. It's even more somehow symmetric, dp over t. So again, this thing's entire. This thing has poles at um, one and zero. So this is pole at s equals one and at zero. So what can we learn about zeta? We know zeta has a pole at one. Well, this is how you can, once you've given this meromorphic continuation, you can see zeta has a pole at one. What about at zero? So we need to know a little bit more about the gamma function. Here's where it becomes useful to use the gamma function, an explicit function like the gamma function. So uh, some exercises, these are well-known facts. Uh, S times gamma of S is equal to gamma of S plus one. So gamma behaves like the factorial function. And what this allows you to do is originally gamma is only defined the Mellon transform of gamma. I think we discussed this. Maybe, maybe I went too quickly over this. This is only good if the real part of s is bigger than zero, right? I have s t to the s minus one needs to be integral near zero. At infinity, there's no problem. So the gamma function is defined perfectly well like this. When s goes to zero, this has a pole. In fact, you can see it like this. Uh, as um, as s goes to negative one, uh, sorry, as s goes to, uh, what am I trying to say? Gamma of s is equal to gamma of s plus one divided by s. And so that's why at zero, you're gonna pick up this pole, but now strip by strip, now you know the values of, of uh, what, the gamma, what the values of gamma should be between negative one and zero, because you know what they are uh, to the right of that. And again, you'll pick up a pole, uh, a pole. So there's poles. So this, so gamma function, this is the gamma function, has gamma has poles at s equals zero, negative one, negative two, and so on. By exactly and, continuing this process, but and, more. And they're simple, more. right? And they're simple poles. Simple poles, thank you. And we can even work out the residues. I mean, I'm just taking something that's uh, meromorphic, dividing by s, and then translating that, that back. Uh, another exercise. Another standard exercise. This is integration by parts. This one's slightly less trivial, but this is also known to Euler. Uh, is that gamma of s times gamma of one minus s is pi over sine pi s, where sine, you know, sine of of s is e to the i s minus e to the minus i s over two i. So this is entire. This is entire. Has no poles. So one over sine has no zeros. 
this thing has no zeros. It does have poles. Sine, of course, has zeros, has zeros at the uh, pi times integers, or when you multiply it by pi, it has, it has zeros at the integers, which means this thing, this product has to have poles, poles at all the integers, which we know it does because zeta of s has, uh, sorry, gamma of s has poles at the negative integers, including zero, and one minus that will pick up the positive integers as poles, simple poles also. Simple poles, sine has simple zeros. Okay, so I think you guys know all this stuff, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going quickly over it, but I think it's because you, you've seen all of this before. Anyway, the point is that the gamma function never vanishes. The polar behavior can't offset any zero behavior to give you something that, that has no zeros. So what, what these two things can conclude is that the function gamma of s, it does have poles, but it has no zeros. And so when you go to divide by gamma to get you zeta, when you go to divide by gamma, uh, you're not creating any new poles. So no new poles for zeta by dividing gamma. You see here, they're packaged together. I only know what zeta times gamma what the polar behavior of zeta times gamma is. So when I divide by gamma, of course, pi is, is, uh, is e to the to e to something. So that never vanishes. Um, so I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't get new poles, but remember gamma has a pole at zero, simple pole at zero. This has a simple pole at zero. This also has a simple pole at zero. So when you divide, they cancel. And zeta does not have a pole at zero. Zeta, therefore, must be regular at zero. Its only pole is one. Okay. So what have we learned so far? Uh, zeta has pole, simple pole at one. Um, it's regular at zero. And because we're dividing by the gamma function, the gamma function has poles. The poles of the gamma function become zeros of the zeta function, are forced to be zeros. And the gamma function has poles at these. The, so the zeroth pole is canceled by the zeroth pole on this side. But the negative integer poles become uh, negative twice integer, because it's s over 2, negative twice integer zeros of zeta, regular at 0. and zeta of negative two and negative four and so on are all zero as Euler already knew. As we discussed, Euler already knew these zeros. What he didn't know is the non-trivial zeros. So this, this thing, this function will sometimes, this weird thing will sometimes be zero. And those are the non-trivial zeros and those are, the, those are what we care about. So this weird function over here, you, you add up all of these things, sometimes you get zero. It's very strange. Has zeros. By the way, where does it have zeros? The zeta function. OK, so we already just, uh, established that the gamma function is never zero. Exponential function is never zero. How about zeta? Uh, rem remember, recall Euler, the Euler product formula, so Euler is that this, when the real part of s is bigger than one, is a product of one over one minus p to the minus s. I don't know why I write this differently every time. Anyway, sometimes I raise it to the minus one, sometimes I write it with one over. Anyway, this is a convergent, for real part of s, this is an absolutely convergent, absolutely convergent product. And absolutely convergent products are zero if and only if one of the entries is zero. But none of these things vanish. These things are never, never zero. Let's make that it's a completely elementary exercise. How do you get, uh, how do you get this? Uh, well, anyway, it's even worse than that because it's one over something. So it doesn't even have a chance of, of vanishing. So it's an absolutely convergent product. I, I did the exercise for you. It's an absolutely convergent product. 
which none of the terms are zero. So this thing is never zero. So it's because of the Euler product formula that the zeta function doesn't vanish in this region. Okay, so again, here's our, here's our real part of S. This is one, this is zero. This is a real part of S, uh, uh, real part of S bigger than one. Let me put the axes so you can see. Okay, so, so the zeta function doesn't vanish here. By the functional equation, it also can't vanish here. So the only place where these magical zeros can be, this thing has zeros, but only in real part of S between zero and one. That's the only place where there's a mystery. And that's the critical strip. Okay, so this is the critical strip. So called critical strip. And its center line is the critical line. line which is okay everybody knows that's where that's where the Riemann half is supposed to be what is this random dot is that supposed to be zero okay drawing within the lines was never my strong suit um so let's get to why what this thing has to do with gauss's conjecture so we've done the analytic continuation meromorphic continuation We've understood something about the polar behavior and the zero behavior. So zeta itself does vanish here at negative two and at uh, and so on. Where, where uh, what I mean by non-zero is the product is non-zero. Um, so we have these trivial zeros, and then who knows what's going on here? Um, great. Why do we care about the zeros of the zeta function? Why zeros and where do we, where do the primes come in? Why zeros? Why? Where are the primes? How are we going to get Gauss's conjecture out of this? Riemann continues. This is all one memoir. This is his only paper. He's got lots of papers on all kinds of things, but he's got one paper on number theory, and this is what he does in all this. Uh, it's worth noting that we didn't need the Euler product at all for the functional equation, and the analytic continuation had nothing to do with Euler products. Absolutely, absolutely, and we'll see. Uh, for modular forms, for example, that come from non-congruence groups, or even from uh, you know MOS forms on, on infinite volume groups, they all have functional equations and analytic continuation by because they're Mellon transforms of theta functions of automorphic representation, right? So, so these theta functions uh, more generally are automorphic representations, and there's a way of computing attaching an L function to it by by a process like this Hecke process. It's called a Hecke. Uh, process, even though it's uh, Riemann. Anyway, it produces Hecke L function. That was the first time that it was realized in this more general way. Um, yeah, we did not need anything uh, about the Euler product. And in, in great generality, there won't be an Euler product. Um, OK. Uh, without the Euler product, by the way, you don't know that there isn't that there can't be zeros even in the region of absolute convergence. Something doesn't have a product formula. If you just give me some summation form, I cannot guarantee that there aren't zeros, not only off the critical line, but outside the critical strip, not just the trivial ones that we, that we know about. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So far, so good. Okay, you guys know all this stuff. All right, so Riemann continues. He's not done yet. He starts with this, with the Euler product formula, and he computes the logarithmic derivative. Of course, I'm, this isn't exactly what he does. If you look, uh, you'll see things of a similar flavor. I'm, I'm giving a modern uh, reinterpretation, modern treatment. Um, so let's take the logarithmic derivative. So, well, let me write log, but uh, he knew better than to write log. Uh, he knows that there's, that there's difficulties with the complex logarithm, but let's just pretend for a second because what I'm about to do with the log, this is just for our ease of computation, but what we do with it will, will actually be reduced. Uh, so a sum over this thing is of course, a product after logs turns into a sum, sum over the primes negative log of one minus P to the minus S, as we've discussed many times, negative log of one minus something. What is it? It's uh, X plus X squared over two plus X cubed over three and so on. That's the series. So that's the log. If we open this up, it's a sum 
Um, so x is p to the minus s. So this is 1 over p to the s plus 1 over 2 p to the 2s plus 1 over 3 p to the 3s, and so on. And um, I can't differentiate p to the s. I always have to convert it into, uh, so the kth term, so the kth term will be 1 over k p to the minus ks, which is e to the minus ks log p. Um, so I guess so. Okay, that's the kth term. And so if I differentiate this, now this part is rigorous. There's no problem with taking the derivative of the zeta function, and there's no problem with dividing by the zeta function. This is all where real part of s is bigger than one. Um, what do we get when we take this derivative? So we get a sum over the primes. Of course, derivatives pass, pass through sums. Everything is absolutely convergent. And the kth term, so, the, so DDS of this, let's take the derivative with respect to s. Um, what happens? There's a 1 over k e to the minus k s log p times negative k log p. Beautiful. That's exactly what I want. What's the link? going on. What's the link? Real analytic Eisenstein series. Epstein zeta is a good example of something with functional equation and, and uh, no Euler product. Yep. And there's a million, million such. Thanks. Thank you, Louis. Uh, what happened here? I'm putting dots and I want these dots. Okay. Uh, right. So the kth term, let's, let's cross out the k's. There's a minus sign. There's a minus sign. It's going to come out of everything. And then it's a sum of um, Here's a log p out of everything. And then there's a sum just of 1 over p to the s plus 1 over p to the 2s plus 1 over p to the 3s, and so on. OK, and the way that he combined this is to write this as a sum over all integers. Of course, there's a minus sign still. And the integer n to the minus s, this is the von Mangold function, the integer n to the minus s occurs if and only if n is a power of a prime p and uh, in the denominator. And it occurs with a factor of log p. Is this the first time that the, is this the first time the von Mangold function comes out naturally in a computation? That is a great question. I believe Riemann already calls it the von Mangold. I'll, I'll post his memoir so we can look back to it. Um, why was von Mangold playing with this? Um, you know, uh, Shebyshev was playing around with uh, sums of log of p, and people sort of knew that if you could if you could sum log of p, and and it was okay to throw in the prime powers. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember what von Mangold was doing with this that that it got his name, but I believe Riemann is already referencing it and sort of discovers that it occurs naturally as this uh, coefficient in the logarithmic group. Uh, maybe someone can quickly Google that and, and tell me if, if my impression is right. Um, other questions? Where did our minus sign come from? The minus sign came from the fact that the p's are in the denominator. Oh, so uh, okay. P to the minus ks is e to the minus ks log p. And so when I differentiate the chain rule, the minus sign comes down. Oh, okay. I, I missed the minus sign in the line in the zeta prime over zeta of s equals. I yeah, it's it here. Up when we introduced von Mangold. Okay, I, I see. And then here it, it came back down. Yeah. Okay. That makes minus sense. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so, um, well, so what does Riemann do with this? He's, he's very good with, uh, he, he, uh, we'll do it the, the modern way, but um, he, he observes, uh, Gauss presumably knew this. So if you, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the summation function, what should I call this? It's not exactly the, is it the Chebyshev function? Chebyshev is usually the, the sum over primes less than x. Instead of summing one, you sum log p. Wait, professor, can you go up for a yes. second? Uh... Okay, no, no, no. Are there? That's good. Sorry. Yeah, no. Okay. I thought there was something weird going on with a negative, but no, I think it's uh -huh. fine. 
yeah, this negative log of one minus x goes in, it gets right, right. sucked into the series, but then another negative com comes out. Great. Um, uh, does this function have a name? Use some log p, log of p, p to the k is less than x. In other words, exactly the summation of von Mangold. Partial summation of von Mangold. So that's that's the Chebyshev function psi this, of x. Okay, this is psi of the x. And then what's this one theta. called? Say it again. They call it theta of x. Theta, fine. This one's no, theta. This Wikipedia one's theta. is calling them like the first and second Chebyshev function. Okay, first I mean, and second Chebyshev. Fine. So um, so right. So so what does this Chebyshev function actually look like? So if you plot this Chebyshev function, presumably you guys all know this again. So it's zero until it hits two. At two, it jumps by log two. At three, it jumps by log three, right? It's a, it's a stepwise function. At four, it jumps by log two, because four is a power of the prime two. At five, it jumps by log five. Six is the first place where it doesn't jump. Six is not a prime power. Seven, it jumps by log seven. At eight, it jumps by log two. At nine, it jumps by log three. At 10, it's flat. Okay, so it's this step function. And very many of the first few numbers are primes or prime powers, which means the first zero of the zeta function is going to be pretty far from the origin. We'll, we'll come to that in a second. So uh, many of the early numbers are prime, primes or prime powers, primes or powers of primes. And this will have a consequence that we'll see in a second, or maybe in a couple of days, uh, that the uh, first zero of zeta, first zero of non-trivial zero of zeta will be high, will be large. It's at what, a half plus 14i, something like this? 14 and change i? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's right. Maybe somebody can correct me. Um, Okay, we'll get to why why these things uh, why you can why one of the things measures the other one. So is so the, right so sorry. Oh, Andre, go ahead. Uh, this is kind of unrelated, but is there um, is there any closed form known for any of the non-trivial zeros? Um, no. Uh, presumably, all of the numbers are transcendental. Presumably, they're all transcendental. You know. Uh, uh, over, uh, they're mutually transcendental. So over once you adjoin a couple of the zeros, it doesn't get you any other zero. This sort of like uh, this sort of tying the narrative of we can't know zeta of three, or maybe we're not meant to know zeta of three. Yeah, we're not like meant to know this first zero. Yeah, we can compute it to as many decimal places as we want. We're, we'll never know it as as a number other than this first. Uh, zero of zeta. Okay, um, so 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 this is the this, this step function. Of course, if you zoom way out, if you go out to three million, which is where Gauss is computing this, and we're bumping things up by log, so by partial summation, this thing will look very much like the function y equals x. You will not see any of these squiggles. It is just going to look like y equals x. And in fact, the difference between the Chebyshev function and, and x, this is what will be of size square root. This will be like a Brownian motion. This is presumably a Brownian motion. This is the Riemann hypothesis, of course. OK, so we'll, we'll uh, maybe, maybe I'll show you some of these, some of these pictures. They're, they're quite uh, striking to look at. Um, OK, so back to what we Riemann was doing. So Riemann does this computation. And so he says, OK, so let's invert this Mellon transform process. So Riemann considers the inverse Mellon transform, 1 over 2 pi i, integral over some function, over, over some, uh, you know, like 2, something where the real part of s is bigger than 1, and uh, zeta prime over zeta of s. Maybe I'll put the minus sign here now so that it doesn't bother us later. Again, in this region, this is a perfectly convergent function. Zeta never vanishes. So this is uh, 
uh, in this region, in the region real part of S is equal to two. This is a nice analytic function. Function. Um, I'm going to multiply it by. So uh, let's let's do this the what I consider the right way. Let's take a test function p, some test function on the positive reals, and let's let this be its Mellon transform. T of t, t to the s dt over t. So I'll put t to the s. Whoops, that's a zero. T to the s, x to the s, ds. I'll give myself a parameter x. And let's compute this thing. Okay. Uh, Lewis, what's the what's the uh, link? Oh, it's a paper I found about the alternative hypothesis for the zeros. Uh huh. Uh, which says that, like, um, based on like what we we know about paracorrelation, we can't rule out that the zeros are spaced like in a arithmetic progression. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what Montgomery. So Montgomery was trying to rule out a z equals zero, and he realized uh, somehow that if there was a z equals zero, then the, there would be this picket fence phenomenon where the zeros would be very evenly spaced, and that's why he said, "Well, what is the spacing of the zeros?" And that's how. Uh, the Dyson, you know, interaction happens and so on. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, in this region of absolute convergence, we can put in the series. So this is given by the series von Mangold over n to the s. We have two sums. Got them in the wrong order. Sum over the integers von Mangold, and then an integral one over two pi i, an integral over some vertical line. B tilde of S, I'll write this as N over X. X is some, some real number bigger than one. N over X to the S, DS. Sorry, to the minus S, DS. That's better. So of course, what is this? I took a nice test function. I took this Mellon transform. I take the Mellon transform. I multiply it by something of the minus s and integrate. Uh, inversion. It's just the, yeah, we're just uh, back to the function itself. So what we found is a way to sum the von Mangold function against something, against some test function. You can imagine this test function being like the indicator function of zero to one. So if t is some approximation to the indicator function of zero to one, then this thing will, will cut off exactly when n over x is bigger than zero. Uh, and when n over x is bigger than one. So if n over x, if this is the indicator function that n over x is less than one, then this is the Chebyshev function. It's exactly the sum of von Mangold up to n less than x. And this is the Chebyshev function. How are we going to establish like the approximate thing formally? We're gonna we're gonna do all that. Yeah, I'll I'll give you the very rigorous uh, derivation of of these things. Right now, I just want to leave it as a okay. as a in smooth form. I have some nice test function. Now, wait a second. Um, are we allowed to even take this integral? We reverse orders and summation and so on. Are we allowed to take the these things? Remember, uh, so to justify this, let's make. I'll add rigor exactly where uh, where we need it at the moment. So uh, uh, I'll show you how to uh, smooth and unsmooth this thing. But um, to add rigor, recall that the Fourier that the Mellon transform is not only this, but if this function is nice, like it's differentiable, uh, it's also negative the integral of the derivative. We did this once before. If I integrate t to the minus s, I get t to the s over t over t to the s over s, d t. So this decays like one over s, that's still not good enough. If we take another integration by parts, we did this when we when we did the proof uh, uh, of Mellon inversion. Yeah, so the t to the Brown's formula kind of technique. Exactly, right? s plus one times s d t. And now we have plenty of uh, decay for uh, 
uh, absolute convergence here. This thing uh, has no, you can put absolute values inside here. You can compute this and put absolute values and it has no decay in the, in the T variable. Uh, this now has quadratic decay in the T variable. This is as a uh, fixed absolute value, okay? So um, plenty of decay, plenty of decay to interchange summations. But I need phi to be smooth to do this. I can't, I, I really need to make sure there's an approximation. I can't uh, do this with, with this function. And a lot of, if you, even if you read Davenport, uh, which I love Davenport, it's a brilliant book. Um, uh, Davenport and, and Heath Brown's uh, version, uh, he, uh, almost anything you read, people really struggle with making this trans with with doing this rigorously. Uh, some people will will put, you know, the the. By the way, the uh, we 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 saw the Mellon transform of this function. The Mellon transform of this function was one over s. So it's exactly this Peron type formula, uh, something to the s one over s ds. People will do things like truncate the integral to go from two minus uh, i times t to two plus i t, so that then there's no problem with interchanging and then take the limits, all kinds of very awkward things that if you do, this I, I learned from Henrik, the yoga of smoothing. Do everything in smooth form, you'll have no trouble reversing orders, and then the, the sort of uh, art of it is how do you unsmooth. So that's what I'll, I'll show you next time. But just to, just to complete the argument, so what have we learned? You take this function as a function of x. So uh, let me get some space. Recap. Recap. We took this function, one over two pi i, integral over a vertical line, negative zeta prime over zeta of s, b tilde of s, x to the s, ds. And we found that it's equal to the sum over all integers, bum angled, times this test function phi of n over x. On the other hand, we have, we have this integral over the vertical line two. But we could just as well pull the contour all the way back. X is a number bigger than one. So the farther back we pull it, the larger a negative power we get here, as long as everything is, is entire and nicely convergent and decaying. So we can pull it, in fact, all the way back. And uh, when we do, what do we get? So where does this, where does this thing have poles? What's the polar behavior? Well, this function, if, if phi is some nice test function, then this, then it's Mellon transforms entire. Let's say it's compactly supported and smooth. Then this thing's entire, no poles. Uh, X to the S is entire. It's an exponential, never uh, has poles and never vanishes. What about the logarithmic derivative? So this has poles if and only if zeta has a pole or zeta vanishes. We don't care about the zeros of the zeta function. We care about the poles of its logarithmic derivative, which happen to be the zeros of the zeta function. Okay, so we know that there's a pole. Let me put this as an x. There's a pole at one. We know that there are zeros at negative two, at negative four, at negative six, and so on, and some other zeros somewhere here. Sort of blasphemy to draw them like this. Really, it's over here at 14, right in the middle. At one half plus 14. That's the real first zero. But we don't know where, where these zeros are. So as we pull contours, and the beautiful thing about logarithmic derivatives is that the residue of zeta prime over zeta at one of these zeros or poles is equal to the multiplicity. It's just a, a number. It's just plus or minus one for every, for every uh, occurrence of that zero or pole. So it occurs with multiplicity. There's no funny residue to take. The residue of a logarithmic derivative is one or negative one. So it's negative one when there's a pole, it's positive one when there's a zero, except we have this negative sign in front. And so, um, so let's, let's, uh, let's do these one at a time. So what about when S equals one? So when S equals one, the contribution from the pole at S equals one, is that this gives a plus one, this gives a tilde of one and an x to the one. 
How about the other zeros? So the other zeros, that's the only pole. That's the only polar behavior of uh, zeta. The rest are all zeros. So now we get a minus sign, minus a sum over all the zeros of zeta. This thing contributes negative one. That's what the minus sign is for. This is uh, the transform, the Mellon transform of phi at rho, x to the rho. And now let's look at these two things side by side. So this is the zeros, zeta of rho is equal to zero. All the zeros of the zeta function, including the trivial ones and including all the non-trivial ones. Let's look at these, let's look at this side and this side side by side. What we have proved, lambda of n mangled phi of n over x is equal to uh, phi tilde of one x to the one minus a sum over all the zeros. And there's no, there's no question about how to take these zeros. In the real, uh, in the, you have to worry about, you know, taking them in conjugate pairs so that you have convergence. There's no issues like this. It can, this converges. Well, we, have, we need to know a little bit more about the behavior of the zeros. Uh, we need to know that zeta is uh, a function of order one and so on. There, there are a few more things to note to make this, this statement rigorous. But what is this? We have a sum on one hand of a test function evaluated on the primes. And on the other side, we have its Mellon transform evaluated on the zeros. Riemann proved Poisson summation in the primes. So Riemann proved Poisson summation in the primes. This is the geometric side. The primes are somehow supposed to be the geometry. The zeros are supposed to be the spectral side. Exercise, make an operator that has this as its eigenvalues, as this is its geometry, take its trace. Prove that that operator is uh, self-adjoint. Then it's, then it's zeros. If you have a general operator, its eigenvalues can be anywhere. Self-adjoint, zeros snap to a line, right? Self adjoint operator has real eigenvalues. Snap those zeros to a line, you get a million bucks. All right. So, so this is Riemann's, what is this called? Explicit formula? Or approximate functional equation. I always get those two backwards. I think this is ex explicit formula. This is the explicit formula. I'm very bad with names, as you, I'm sure. Hang on. So in this formula, which symbols are the test function phi and which ones are zeta? I'm sorry. Uh, none of them are zeta. They're all supposed to be phi, phi except this row. OK. These are rows. I got the rows. OK. And these are phi's. There's no more zeta. You tell me any test function you like, you sum it over the primes. And then you take its Mellon transform, it's like a Fourier transform, and you sum it over the zeros. And these two things for all values of x will agree. That's pretty amazing. It's an insane formula, yes. And next time we will see how to use this formula to prove the prime number theorem. both in smooth form and then unsmooth, using uh, these, these smooth functions the whole time. Any questions? So next class, right, you're going to be streaming this, but we're also going to be in person, right? Anyone who wants to come in person, I'll be in the room. Anyone who wants to watch virtually is welcome to do so. Of course, I encourage those of you uh, around to keep me company. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to show up. Yeah. I want it to be completely uh, up to you what you what you feel comfortable with. And, and there's some people watching from uh, farther away. So, But I'll be in the room.
Any other questions, comments, discussion? Yeah, no. I'm just really looking forward to that unsmoothing because I remember for Nick's complex class, I remember looking over it and you did yes. everything except the unsmoothing. So right, we uh, ran out of time. Yeah, there's a there's a really fun argument which I have not seen anywhere, by the way. Uh, but really? I'll be very happy uh -huh. to show you. Uh, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it discussed. As far as I know, this is maybe the first time that it'll be written down. I'd be happy to be pre proved wrong. I'll show you the argument, and then you'll tell me if you've, if you've seen it elsewhere. It's an argument that's used all over the place in other contexts. But in this particular context, I've never seen it applied with Mellon uh, convolution. The right way to make a smooth function is take the function you want and convolve it with a little uh, function that you can control. So we'll discuss all of that. It's, it's a very important uh, analytic technique to have in your tool belt. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds amazing. Right, it like turns this uh, really difficult to understand proof into something that's right where the number theory is simple and then there's just some analysis at the end, right? And the analysis is simple. Right. I, I remember I, I reading uh, the only like complete proof I know is Apostle's proof. And it's, you know, it's like you say, you, you have these like half discrete things, half continuous things, and then you're really having to worry about a lot of strange things, right? Halfway through. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So we'll hopefully I can convince you that this argument is completely natural. All right. So, uh,